Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and we are excited to have you along for another episode. The Latter Gay Stories Podcast is your opportunity to understand the, and inspect the intersection of sexuality and reality where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. This is another great episode where we are talking about important topics surrounding the LGBT world and what it's like to come out. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is supported by viewers and listeners just like you. If you want to make a financial donation to the podcast and help us continue building bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities, we invite you to make a donation. There are two simple and easy ways of doing that. First, by visiting our website at LatterGayStories.org and clicking on the Donate tab. Or if you're Venmo friendly, we invite you to make a donation that way, at Latter Gay Stories on Venmo. If you are watching on one of the video versions of our podcast through Facebook or YouTube on our YouTube channel, we invite you to subscribe or like the page and comment below. If there's something that jumps out at, uh, at you as we go through the episode, we invite you to share your comments. Or if you have a question for the guest, uh, that's the great, a great place to do it as well. We can have a real-time discussion as this episode goes through and discuss exactly uh, what your thoughts are regarding this episode. And if you're on an audio version through one of our audio players, like Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Apple the, through the Apple Podcast Network, or iHeartRadio, we invite you to subscribe to the channel and even give us a rating. That rating boosts uh, us up through the various LGBT-themed podcasts to allow us a bigger and wider reach. We are excited to bring you this episode today. Um, the Often as I speak at LGBT conferences and, and in small group meetings, I speak about the, this uh, principle or this uh, analogy of the oxygen mask. So for many of you who have um, sat through one of my um, speaking opportunities, you're probably familiar uh, with that concept. But it's, um, it's something we're going to talk about today, and that is securing your oxygen mask before looking around and helping other people. So without much uh, further ado, I want to welcome into the podcast, Skylar Wixom. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm, I'm excited for this episode um, because this really is a story about securing your oxygen mask, self-care, um, overcoming ideas of selfishness mm -hmm. in order to um, become who and what you are. Right. And thrive. Yes. And that's the important part of the, the podcast message that uh, this episode will go through today. So thanks for giving us a few time, a few minutes of your time. Of course. Um, and exposing all of your secrets to the world <laughs> in such a small and kind format. Uh, <laughs> for really the first time. Yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. what, that, I like vulnerability. <laughs> well, you'll get um, as much as I'm able to give today. <laughs> so we're gonna thrive on um, some nuggets of vulnerability today. And I know you as the guest will, will definitely take advantage of, uh, you will be well, uh, fed in this podcast episode. Absolutely. Just just because what I what I know about your story and, and what we've been able to talk about, it really will. It's a story of hope and it's a story of success and moving on. Yes. And uh, thriving. Yes. That, that's the important part. So, for those who don't know Skyler, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little background. Sure. Um, so I am from Idaho Falls, Idaho, born and raised. Family still lives there. Um, I. Uh, went to BYU Idaho from well I went on a mission um, to Minnesota um, and then I went to BYU Idaho studying English um, and then after graduating from there came here to Boise for grad school um, graduated with my master's and I'm currently an adjunct professor in for writing at Boise State University um, and now just kind of dwelling here in Boise so what uh, what mission in Minnesota is there just one mission there's just one it's the Min uh, Minnesota Minneapolis mission um, there are other missions that have like parts of Western Minnesota in it, but there's only one named Minnesota mission. There you go. The MMM. I was close. I was in the Michigan Lansing. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was close, um, yeah. but I didn't get much into the upper peninsula. Uh, just a little bit. I know that's part of the Wisconsin mission and, so, so and Wisconsin's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I made it to the UP once. There you go. Yeah. Say <laughs> yada to the UPA. Yeah. The UPA. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the Michigan Lansing mission. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's that area is very. Uh, it's I, I love how uh, Scandinavian Canadian it is up there. That's right. So yeah. very, uh, the the Finnish copper miners. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So, never had lutefisk though. 
No, you didn't, huh? I didn't. I should have, and it was a missed opportunity. Uh, you should have had a, a Michigan pasty, which is a pot pie kind of thing in tin foil. Okay. So, <laughs> that's what they did up there. There you go. That, that was it. Nice. So, um, served a mission. Um, mm-hmm. So, very Mormon. Yes. Oh, yes. A, a zealous Mormon. Zealous Mormon. Yeah. 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 Well, so, we'll talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Um, before we jump into that aspect of the story, at what point did you realize I'm different? I think a lot of it happened um, in my, when I was a kid, like in elementary school. I just realized that I was um, more, I was very sensitive in good and bad ways. I was so kind to everyone because I didn't really know how to be otherwise. Um, But I was also um, somewhat fragile. I would easily cry. I would easily, I like, um, and I would just get really emotional um, a lot. And that was different than the other, you know, the other boys running around getting rough with each other. I just kind of kept, you know, arm's length from that stuff. And I preferred to just, you know, talk with people. I've always been that way. I've, I've preferred to have conversations and to connect with people rather than romp around and, and, uh, and, and even anything super hands-on I never really liked as a kid. Um, when I realized I was different as far as liking guys instead of liking girls, um, it was, there's, there, there's got to be experiences before this, but it was when I was a very vivid memory when I was 14. Um, we went on a Salmon River run, kayaking, rafting, and, um, and it was the river guides, man. It was. <laughs> they literally floated your boat. Huh? Oh my gosh. They were shirtless. They were, um, they, they were built because uh, they, of course, they, you know, have been doing that. Uh, they've been rafting and kayaking all day. Um, and then we're in the still parts of the river on the rafts, we would have raft wars where, you know, we'd pull each other off of the rafts and like, you know, try to, and it was just super fun. And I just remember think, strategically placing myself in the raft where I knew someone was swimming up to it and just thinking, well, yeah, if you get me, if you pull me out, then so be it. Um, oh, his hands. Oh, his, <laughs> oh, his hands, yep. Um, of course, keeping all that to myself. Uh, and then once I got pulled in, like, dang it, I was pulled in. Um, hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, and stuff like that. I'm wet with salvation. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when I was kayaking, I always hung, you know, hung around the river guide as much as possible. So, no. Look at you. Look at me. There were, again, there were definitely times before that um, that I have remembered before, but have since forgotten the things I remembered. So, um, but it came very naturally. Um, always been uh, more drawn uh, to guys. My, my, all my experiences of my sexual awakening were, mm-hmm. with, were with men rather than women. So what was it like growing up um, in the church, knowing that that was in the back of your mind? Uh, priesthood, mm-hmm. deacon, teacher, quorum, mm-hmm. de- deacon, teacher, priest. Yeah. Uh, how were those, what was quorum like life? I, like? starting off, um, when, I, when I turned 12 and first became a deacon, it was really hard because... I was still kind of figuring out that whole um, sensitivity thing. Um, Not not that it was a bad thing, but I was a very, um, it's it's funny, I was this mix between uh, mild and kind and approachable and very outgoing, um, which meant that when people were mean to me, it was even more uh, hard because they were mean to a me that I was expressing very loudly. So there was a little bit of bullying when I was 12 and 13 because of just my persona was different. Um, But about halfway through my 13th year, um, the ward split and lots of my friends came in the ward who were a lot like me um, in that way where they were a little more, I guess at the time we called it nerdy, a little more um, accepting of the non-traditional, you know, male persona. Um, and And from that point on, I loved quorum. I love priesthood quorum. Um, my friends were in there. Going on campouts was awesome. Um, going to church was awesome. Um, eventually when the ward split again and all my friends, you know, dutifully left and went to a different ward, um, and I didn't have many of my close friends in there, I made friends with the leaders, um, my young men's leaders when I was a priest, when I was 16. Um, and at that point I was in high school and, 
Um, middle school was, uh, for everyone it's awful. So yeah, it was awful. But in high school, and a, again, in, in priest quorum, I had some amazing friends um, who liked the same things I liked, like choir and musical theater and all the things that gay Mormons love. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then at church, and, and then I kind of established myself as um, a trendsetter. I didn't necessarily uh, follow the cues of other people, but I still wanted to make sure that I came off as you know manly enough, straight enough. Didn't want to give anybody an indication. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, because I had crushes on you know boys in high school, and some some of them my friends, some of them were just the upperclassmen that I you know. Observed from a distance. Uh, I wonder if he rafts. Right. Uh, rafts. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> right. Rose kayaks. <laughs> That's right. Um, and but I had to, so I took cues from everyone else. What kind of girls should I um, express express interest in? Quote. Um, and it, it was either that, like you know, declaring my interest in someone that was largely desirable, or it was you know the girls that my personalities and their person. It was my friends that I said, oh, I like this person. Um, and I, you know, even for, it was what, six days that me and a girl um, were dating. And and then we just kind of both, when we weren't feeling it, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> that, and I think a lot of the girls, even though they didn't know to call it, you know, to they didn't wouldn't ever pin me as gay necessarily. Maybe they would, I never talked to them since. Um, but I think they sensed that I was more friend material. And I think that had a lot to do with it, that I didn't have that sort of drive and even nervousness around them. That I was just really comfortable. So I ended up being the, the guy that the girls talked to about other guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember being frustrated by that, um, meaning that I wanted to be found desirable by someone. Um, it just couldn't be by guys at that point. Um, but in high school and even on my mission, it wasn't as frustrating Except for the, you know, I was wondering when this, when I would start being attracted to women. Um, but marriage wasn't even on my mind. It wasn't a pressure. I was having fun going on dates with girls because it was all these group things and we were all such good friends. Um, and uh, so I wasn't so worried about it. And then going on my mission, I had one focus and it wasn't marriage. So it wasn't... It wasn't on my radar. It wasn't until coming home that I had to like face it. Let's talk about um, your mission. Okay. Um, let's lead lead through the mission. Uh, often elders who get focused on the work mm -hmm. don't struggle, and I air quote the struggle sure. yeah. um, with uh, feelings of uh, their sexuality. Yeah. Because they are so focused on the work, they're they're not. And this is this is an interesting concept because we just did a I did a podcast interview, and one of the uh, the, uh, the one of the people in the inter interview said I was attracted to much older men, so the companionship wasn't even an issue yeah. um, because that just wasn't anything I yeah. was interested in, and that was something that I hadn't ever really considered before. But I do know the common thread in a lot of uh, situations is we were just busy working, and it wasn't something. I was using my mission as the opportunity to ungay myself. Like uh, the more I, the more I put into the mission, the more faithful I become. They yeah. had made deals and pacts and promises with God. I serve you honorably. You take this away from me. So they were in that that mode, or they just didn't have a worry. What was your situation experience my, like? Uh, very, very, very similar to what you just said. I threw myself into the work. Um, part of that was just that zeal I was talking about, and that zeal was so good for me. I loved having that. Um, and part of it was, you know, I've always had a guilt complex. <laughs> so I was a very obedient missionary. Um, I wasn't, uh, maybe this is just me trying to paint myself as better than I was, but I don't know if I was necessarily like hard-nosed, like um, exact, exact obedience. Um, I, th I think, I tried to be exactly obedient, but I tried to have as much fun as I could too within those guidelines. And and yes, throw myself into the work. Um, with my companions, um, it was never really, an, it, there was never really a, much of an issue. A couple of them were cute, but um, 
you live with someone 24-7 in sight and sound, you learn their quirks pretty quickly. And they become uncute really A little quick. bit, yep. yeah. Um, mm. No th no offense meant towards any of my companions. <laughs> it had nothing to, I had great companions all around. Such good guys. Um, but when you're sight and sound of someone, you pick up on the little things, how they walk, how they talk, how they eat, how they breathe. Like it's, and it just, you learn really quickly. Um, yeah. The honeymoon is over. A little bit. Yeah. So, um, uh, but a lot of the, any crushes I developed were on other missionaries that weren't my companions. Um, but even those, it was just like, cool, I get to go on an exchange with this really cute elder. Um, and we'll pal around and have a good time. And it was enough for me to just be accepted um, and liked as a person. Um, that, was, that was affirmation enough that I didn't necessarily uh, seek out any sort of um, physical reinforcement, but it was nice whenever I got it. Mm -hmm. Like those you know, missionary hugs and stuff like that and, um, and stuff like that. That isn't to say that sometimes it was, you know, it weighed on my mind. There were times on my mission when I served on a college campus or even just tracting around and someone like this, you know, this nice built guy would answer the door or was walking around on campus or running around shirtless and I would be like, well, hello. <laughs> um, do, do you want to be one of our investigators and I will Cause do in the same. <laughs> I'm investigating you. Because I'm investigating you, right. Um, and I, I and I would replay a lot of scenarios in my mind about those random guys that we would run into. Um, the mission really is a gay place to grow up. Oh my gosh! When you when you really yes. like if you analyze the whole mission experience, so many I love you elders. Yes. At night, hugs. Hugs. Mm -hmm. um, even in difficult times, lots of really close. I'll hold you and be here as you struggle yep. through whatever you're struggling with. Uh huh. Um, uh, homesick, loneliness issues. Yep. And you're only talking, and, and you're talking about like the, when things are rough or things are beautiful or things are, and, and there's a whole comedy side to it as well. Mm -hmm. Straight guys love to joke about being gay and that involves a lot of physical contact. That's right. And that happens. <laughs> I mean, look, look how often we talk about the tree of life at the oh, yeah. MTC. It the, wasn't there when I was there. Yeah, well you missed out. I know. Um, no, we had, we had curtains. Uh, but, uh, and for those of you who are listening to the podcast episode and have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> the tree of life. You should have been there. Yeah. You should have, absolutely. Um, you know what was the funniest thing, though, is when I told missionaries that I had never kissed a girl. Um, or a guy. I mean, I, that, that one perished the thought. I would yeah. never have. But I'd never kissed a girl either. And when missionaries heard that, they would, like, talk about how amazing it was. And they would try to, like, tell me how I needed to do it. When for my first time, I was a novelty. I was this person that needed to be taught. It was it was weird. It happened all the time. Guys, don't take this the wrong way, but maybe just like practice on me and show me how you kiss. Right, me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and they viewed it as wow. He was a very strong, like uh, um, devoted. You know, he he wasn't going to lose focus of his mission by kissing a girl. And um, and I've said this before, I've written about this in, in you know, like just a, an essay that I wrote. It's not anywhere out there, it's on my com just on my computer, it was for a class. That for a while I looked at them as just kind of clownish, just like arguing about how to kiss a girl. Uh, they'd be like, well first you grab her face, and they're like, no you don't grab her face, that's weird. <laughs> and they'd be arguing about it, and then I'd be feeling the fire, so I'm like, okay, so after I grab her face, and they're like, you don't grab, it was super funny. And I, for a while, I viewed it as very clownish. But how authentic was that of them? Like, that's not, they were being so themselves in that moment. And part of me was really jealous of that, that they got to talk about um, how to kiss a girl and be so excited and have that, you know, weird embarrassment about it, but it's really cute embarrassment because we all know how, we all know how it is. Mm -hmm. We all accept me. And they weren't clownish at all. If anything, I was, I was the one that was wearing kind of the, the face paint, pretending to be something else, and they were stripping off the paint and being their authentic selves, which was enviable. So when was the first time you came out to somebody? Um, it was at the end of my mission, the literal last day of my mission. Um, the, we had our exit interviews with the mission president. And it was really funny because, you know, my friends would 
come out of this exit interview and they'd be like, well, expect the, you know, get married as quick as you can discussion. And I was like- From your mission president. From my mission president, right. And that's so common, uh -huh. right? Um, I loved my mission president. He, he is an amazing individual. Um, and so going into the interview, I'm like, okay, I'll get the spiel. And so we sit down, we start talking, and he's like, so Elder, um, I wanna ask you this question. What would be the thing that would, it, it was something like this. Um, if anything were to make you lose the faith or leave the church, what would that be? I don't know if he asked everyone that or if he just asked me, but it was a, the question that I needed. <clears throat> I wouldn't have come out otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so I, that's when I told him, I um, am attracted to men. Um, couldn't use the word gay yet. Uh, later I learned how to say, say same-sex attraction, right? Oh, thank, but, you. thank you, church. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I told him I'm attracted to men. And he responded in the best way possible. And he said, how lonely must it have been your whole life not having told anyone and carrying this around. I'm so sorry that you've been going through this alone. Uh, so none of the missionaries here know and none of your family doesn't know? I said, no, I haven't told anyone. And he said, okay, wow, well, when you get home, you need to tell, you tell your bishop and tell your parents, or at least tell your dad. And uh, that this is probably a different story, but I dutifully ignored that for six years. <laughs> I told my bishop. Oh, way to get on, way to get on that uh, that boat so quickly. I know. Sorry, President. Yeah. <laughs> that was the reason why your life fell apart. Ugh. You waited so long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so, so. You would come out to your mission president first. I think that, I mean, that's a story of great empathy. Um, yeah. To, to have a mission president in that position say, not, well, you should, you should change or this will be fixed or um, the advice <clears throat> that typical church leaders would give. Yeah. But he was able to sit with you in empathy and say, oh, how lonely your yeah. life must have been. It was, it was the best response I could have imagined. Yeah, I can that's, see how so beautiful I, that is. I realize this isn't everyone's story. So sometimes I hesitate to say it, but... That's, the, that's been a lot of the story of my life. And it was, is it because I'm lucky or picky? I don't know. Or do, do I, am I very careful about who I associate with? That's probably part of it. But a lot of times, my mission, I didn't choose my mission president, and yet here sits this empathetic, empathetic man um, who, um, guess what, didn't lose an ounce of his conviction to his faith by simply empathizing with me. It's a great point. Yeah. That's, that's a great message to anyone who's listening to this podcast, who's a member of the church trying yeah. to better understand this world. He sacrificed nothing. Nothing. But gave you everything. Yeah. And, and that's the story, again, I'll probably talk about it later. That's the story of my parents, very devout, still active, um, very believing members of the church, and yet are happy that I'm happy and they are working to understand and accept me and make their home a comfortable place for me. And guess what? Their faith's not threatened by it. So you come out to your, bish yeah, your mission, president, mission president and then you say bishop. And then uh, every bishop since. <laughs> um, you so, just break them in. Oh yeah, that was my first thing whenever I got into a new ward was, um, bishop, can I meet with you? Sit down. Bishop, I have same sex attraction. Um, and I just want to let you know. Here's my sash and merit badge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and by and large, um, their comments all came from places of love, you know, from that point on. Even if some of their comments were ignorant, it was because they didn't know better, not because that they wanted me to uh, change or felt that something was wrong with me necessarily. Uh, I did have one awful bishop, but um, who, who was a little, you know, hostile in some ways. Uh, I won't go into that. But um, but mostly they, they just were very supportive of me. Some encouraged me just to do my best, which is, I mean, actually very good advice. Um, you know, obviously encouraging me to stay active, but then to just kind of figure things out. And they didn't presume to have all the answers. Um, some of them were like, okay, I believe that you can be in a traditional marriage. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I, I have faith that that is something that's in store for you. Um, 
again, that's founded in a place of love because they wanted that for me. Um, you said that the um, the bishops didn't always say or do the right things. What is, what advice do you give bishops? Um, you, you said some of them said the right things. Yes. Others said and did uh, contrary things. Right. I would say that um, there, there's a whole multitude of wrong and right ways to go about talking to someone, um, you, the gay and lesbian and transgender members of your congregations. Um, and the very right ways include not being so worried that they are going to explore their sexuality. Um, obviously, you trust that we know what the consequences of our actions are and that we are going into them with full knowledge of what some what doing something means for our membership you aren't the first person to explain this concept to exactly. us exactly yeah. um i've 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 been i've been around the block a time or two as the gay man of the two of us yeah. right um so the best thing to do is say okay i know you're exploring keep me in the loop um i will listen to you i even if they say something like, you know my position, you know I'm the bishop of the ward, and my and I have a testimony of this. You no, know, don't have to apologize for that. But also saying, I realize how difficult this is. I can't imagine. Please teach me. As a bishop, the best thing you could do is be the listener and the learner, not the teacher and the uh, mentor. And lawgiver. And lawgiver, right. Um, and that's hard when you're a judge in Israel, right? Because that's one of your titles as a bishop. But um, you don't <laughs> you don't know what it's like to be gay, and you don't, and lots of you don't have degrees in counseling. So you've got to be so careful with the advice that you give young gay members of the church, because they will take your words as gospel a lot of the time. And a lot of that, if, if unchecked, is harmful advice, like, um, like try to force yourself into a traditional marriage um, and trust that God will take care of that. Pray more. Exactly. Attend the temple more often. Yep. Fulfill your callings better. Yep. And yep. This, this will go away. It never make pro promises. It, just never a good idea ever a good idea. You can encourage to pray and say, pray for clarity, pray for a closer relationship to God, closer relationship to the Savior. Um, the temple might help you do that, um, but never do it with the, uh, the promise that something will happen or an answer that you will receive. Trust that God can do it without you imposing what God's going to say. Yeah, and, and I think another great point, and you, um, mm -hmm. I mean, chime in if it related, mm -hmm. but often the uh, our personal revelation differs from this judge of Israel revelation. Yes. And that's very difficult for someone sitting on the opposite side of the bishop's desk mm -hmm. to articulate and explain. Yeah. Um, I understand you're the judge of Israel. I understand that there's a manual that's sitting mm -hmm. in your drawer or on your iPad that yep. tells you how you should feel. Yep. But my personal revelation is different than that. Yep. The, my spiritual confirmation is different. Yes. And that's really hard to explain to a bishop mm -hmm. who is just trying to be the judge in Israel. Right. And I get how difficult the position of a bishop must be in that in that circumstance. They, I think, I think they're so afraid of endorsing things. Um, like when I, the, my, one of my bishops here, one of the best men I know, um, he, uh, when, I, when I told him I'm going on dates with guys um, and I'm exploring that, um, he didn't say, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. That's not what we believe. He said, okay, that's, if that's what you feel you need to do, um, I, he, he, but he never said that's what you should do. And I get why, because as a bishop, then you are then endorsing something that is contrary to what the church teaches. And that's a difficult position to be in. Even if you want to say, yeah, it's important that you explore. Um, friends can say that, but bishops are in a tricky position, which is why listening and learning is always, always the best thing to do. In that circumstance, he gave you the ability to exercise your agency. Absolutely. And 
Um, I won't even say he allowed for it because he doesn't have the authority to allow anything. I'm going to do it whether or not he allows he, it. He acknowledged he your, acknowledged your agency. That's a, that's a much better way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, he acknowledged my agency. And um, and there, there were no threats. There were no, if you do this, then this. He just said, I, you, I, I want you to be so confident and happy in your choices. And here is where I found my happiness. You can, you can bear testimony of what you believe. That's totally fine if it comes from a place of love. Um, but don't impose that on the person you're talking to. So, so you have this, these rounds of bishops. I'm assum- assuming this is um, your college life at this point. Yes, very similar. So, so you have uh, free reign to go out and do whatever you want to do. You're not out to your parents. Right. You're out to this string of bishops and probably a handful of friends. Yes. How yeah. are you navigating that path? Uh, in, at, in my, during my undergrad? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so through college, are you dating? Are you out there exploring? What, what does that whole world look like in, in, under oh, Skylar's umbrella? Yeah. I didn't start doing that until I moved here to Boise, the exploring part. It, at BYU-Idaho, I was still on the, on the path. And, oh, I would have been terrified to date guys at BYU-Idaho. I would... <laughs> not even a really honor code issue is not even a question. What's that? With with the honor code is not even a question. Oh you yeah, just, I could have been kicked out. Yeah, yeah, in a heartbeat. In a in a heartbeat, and I still in a handhold. In a really. handhold. <laughs> <laughs> and I still had some of that good old Mormon zeal. I was an elders quorum president at BYU Idaho. Um, I really enjoyed being um, a part a part of it. I loved uh, you know I kind of stepped into this martyr position to the people I was out to. Oh, Mormons love martyrs. Oh, they do. They love them. Um, and so I, da- I dated girls at BYU-Idaho. Um, I had two girlfriends and each of them lasted a less than a month. Um, because, and I've, I never kissed either of them. See, so if you would have went to Provo, you would have been engaged in that time. Exactly. So. Um, and oh my gosh, two amazing girls. Uh, one at the beginning of BYU-Idaho, one at the very end. Um, if they're watching this, they know who they are. Uh, <laughs> amazing people. Um, and when uh, one of them, uh, this, and this was so wrong of me, I came out to her so that she would break up with me. It didn't work. <laughs> and so I, I had to later break up with her um, because I just realized I couldn't do it at that time. Um, I just told myself I needed more time. And then at the end, I, 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 this girl was incredible. Um, everything that if I were straight, I would have been looking for. Um, and then at the end of BYU Idaho, uh, another incredible, um, mature, intelligent girl, um, and uh, we had so much fun dating. But because our our personalities and our and our friendship chemistry was just so strong and still is with this particular girl, um, that uh, it, it was just incredible. But uh, I was graduating and she was just starting. And so that was one of the reasons that we broke up. But another reason, but when we did break up, it was kind of mutual. She initiated it and I agreed. Um, it wasn't a sense of relief that, okay, I, I, I don't have to you know, be around this person. I was really sad that that kind of relationship was over, but it was this relief that I wasn't expected to perform as a straight man or be a straight man and have those expectations. And so at that point, I soon moved to Boise, went on three different dates, and those three different girls became three of my best friends still to this day, <laughs> and uh, then realized it just wasn't going to work. So um, back to your question, what's the, what was the exploration like? Is that kind of... Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, I, at some point you had to pull yourself out of Mormon mode. Yes. Um, you're, you're up front with your bishop saying, yep. I'm, I'm gay, I want to pursue dating. And that was here, yep. And so I, I just wondered what that, that trail looked like. Oh, terri- I was terrified. Um, I was pro- it was probably really cute to watch. Like, I wish I could have seen myself. I, uh, I uh, hopped onto Tinder. Oh, boy. And b- before even that, I, like, went on some dating sites and just, like, and just kind of, like, looked and window shopped a little bit and just like and and it was this secretive thing i did and i fake profile yeah oh yeah. no picture there, yeah. well not fake it's just no picture um and no name um because someone would have found me out um but then when i decided i'm gonna go on dates um i hopped onto tinder matched with someone 
Um, and then we set up a time and I'm just like, oh. And I was just like, what's gonna happen? Um, it was nice to feel that, that nervousness that um, I'm gonna be on a date with someone that I'm attracted to for the first time. And um, it turned out to be a really boring date. It was so bad. <laughs> I really did not have a good time. Um, but then even following that, uh, the, the next several dates I went on, um, just so exciting, just, and, and scary. Um, I was still like, I was still, I, I, I took this three path approach that um, I, I had since come out to my parents. Um, and I, and at some point I told them, so I'm exploring three life paths, single and celibate, maybe dating some women and dating some guys. Um, and that I never dated any more girls. <laughs> <laughs> I took one of those paths. I didn't explore three paths. Um, so it was exciting and it was, and I, it was, I was nervous. I was, um, uh, a 14 year old in a 27 year old's body. And it was really nice. I remember those days. Oh yes. Yep. <laughs> it was really, really nice. Um, you finally yeah. were able to connect with the stories and experiences of our peers. Yeah. Of the missionaries yes. from your mission. Yes. Of your friends in college that saw um, how a relationship functions yep and what it feels and looks like yep yep completely understand it yeah um and, and it's the yeah. other aspect of this topic that and maybe this is a great time to talk about it mm -hmm. um and you you alluded to it earlier so often members of the church or leadership within the church views this topic as a sexual topic yeah um as the the primary component of homosexuality or same-sex attraction yeah but the reality is for many of us it has nothing to do with sex and everything with connection yes and companionship uh -huh. and relatability mm -hmm. um, and the rest of our a future yeah. uh, that is right. the component that Absolutely. that is what we're interested in mm -hmm. um, the rest of that is just part of any other normal relationship Yes. Um, the, the functions and abilities and benefits mm -hmm. of that relationship. Yep. So looking at this from that aspect, I, I could say members of the church, mothers, fathers, friends who listen to episodes just like this, um, my piece of advice is to not look at this as a topic of sexuality, of sexual experience or intimacy, but look at this as uh, intimacy and friendship and companionship and the desirability to love and be loved. Abs, you couldn't, yeah, perfectly put. So I, I was glad, because I think as in true Mormon fashion, you still left the option to date women on the table. <laughs> I, part of that was to, to ease my parents' uh, transition into the, their journey is, is, it's a journey just like mine, so. Let's talk about your coming out with your parents. Okay, how, yeah. how, What did you do? Because there, there will be listeners of this podcast who are, very closeted yep. and exploring ways of coming out. Yep. Um, how did that go for you and your parents? What was that experience like? Uh, y yes, so um, you gotta understand one thing about me is uh, classic overthinker, absolutely. Um, I've spent my life um, analyzing every single action of mine because a lot of the Mormon experience, gay or not, is seeking affirmation from everyone around you. And my, I, even, even my identity was based on what people saw me as. Um, or what they may think of me. Or what they, exactly. Um, and, and again, that's another topic, but because of that, I had learned to um, put every word I said and every action of mine under a, like a, under a microscope and plan everything and uh, prepare for different outcomes as best I could. So what I did um, was I made sure that it wasn't around any major holidays that I would ruin. Um, and so it was a weekend in October. Uh, called my parents, or I called my mom and I said, hey mom, I'm coming to visit. And she said, oh great, it'll be good to see you. And I said, now, when I come, I want to sit down with you and dad and I want to have a conversation about something that has been a pretty big part of my life for a while, and I'm ready to let you guys in on. Dun, dun, dun. 
Yes, exactly. And my mom was like, okay, good. Um, do, do you want to say anything more about that now? And I said, no, I think I'll just talk to you in person. She said, okay. Um, and I think a couple days later, I even called again just to make sure that, you know, the weekend was still open. And I think I just re-emphasized, so we're going to talk, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. What's her name, Skylar? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's what was on their mind. Um, I think my mom later told me that they had joked, oh, do you think he's gay? <laughs> I don't know if they did or not. Um, so I got home and the plan was to have dinner um, and then go into the living room. And I, I made it a point that it was, I wanted it to be a sit down thing so that they knew at least some of the gravity of it. Um, so I wanted it to be very <laughs> like, not formal, but kind of. Um, and so I got there and they could not wait. They were like, okay, uh, dinner's in the oven. Why don't we sit down <laughs> and uh, you can tell us what you've been wanting to tell us. And so um, they sat on the couch and I sat in my chair and I knew I wouldn't be able to just say it. I knew I wouldn't be able to say the words. And so I had written a letter to them that I would read aloud in front of them. Um, it was a nice in-between between sending them a letter and telling them straight up, I did both. So I uh, pulled out the letter. Um, I don't know if I have it anywhere, but it's, you know, I don't remember all of what it said. Um, the gist of it was, I am I said, I am attracted to men, I'm gay. Like, it's something definitive like that. And then making sure that they knew I'm still the same person, that... Um, that I'm still the I'm still the son that they raised. I'm still the son that they love. My personality is the same. Who I am is the same. This is just something I've been experiencing for a long time, um, and uh, I wasn't sure if they were going to be shocked or if they had an idea. I hoped they that they had suspected. Um, it had never crossed their minds, not once. Um, so there isn't a girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I just remember the shocked look on their faces and there was some silence. Um, and I think I had to say, I said, I, I, know, I have to know what you guys are thinking right now. Um, my dad spoke first and he said, this changes nothing. For me, it, it just, I still love you. I still think you're one of the best people in the world that I know. This doesn't change anything for me. Sweet. Awesome. My mom, it was much more, um, she, was, she was the most shocked. Um, she was, she had some remorse and she said, you've been going through this by yourself. And what have we said that's hurt you? Um, I think she was replaying anything she might have said about, you know, the gay community or the topic of homosexuality and things like that. Um, and and she, and she just said, I am so sorry if I've ever hurt you in any way. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And then, and then it took a little while to normalize a little bit. Um, and, uh, but here's the cool thing about my parents. Um, they didn't um, try to make me do anything that I didn't want to do. They didn't tell me what to do. They they bore their testimony several times, which is great. Um, and it, as parents, I understand why it's because the stake of even a bishop or a friend in your in what you choose to do with your life is much lower. Mm -hmm. So they, it's easier for them to be like a little more okay with what you're doing because they're not thinking of you when they go to bed at night. Uh, friends and bishops necessarily. Good point. But parents do because they love you. Um, and also, this topic now, it's out of sight, out of mind until you have someone who's directly impacted by it. Exactly. So now they're intimately involved. Exactly. So the cool thing about my parents is they didn't, uh, they didn't ever thrust any unwarranted expectations on me that their love was conditional. Um, it has never been, ever. Um, they respected me and loved me so much, even, even more after I came out, I felt like. And... Especially, um, my mom would ask me questions. She never pretended that she was all fine with everything. And I didn't know 
that that's exactly what I wanted was her to not pretend to be fine. She struggled just like I was struggling. And she would ask me questions. She would get clarification. She'd just be like, okay, so when you were interested, you, when you said you had interest in a girl, what was that? Um, and then later when I talked about my difficulty with the church, she said, okay, so these spiritual experiences that you had, what do you, how do you see them now? Um, so she has open dialogue and she has expressed discomfort with certain things, but she has never, ever, ever made it my fault. She's always said, now I feel uncomfortable with this, but that's me. That's not you. That's not your fault. Um, I don't know if she said those words exactly, but that was always, always the underlying vibe. Um, and, uh, and slowly she starts getting more comfortable with asking questions. Slowly she's, um, you know, just, just very curious. And, and yeah, I think it's still a struggle that I'm not finding happiness the same place that they have, but they know that I'm finding happiness. Do you, do you appreciate those questions? Do you yes. appreciate that dialogue? Yes. Ask questions, please. It's that same thing. They entered into the role of learner rather than like teacher, mentor. They don't know what it's like to be gay and they know that. So they are there to be, to learn and be educated and to empathize. And in a very real sense, you don't know what it is to be gay either. And this is a little bit of a journey for you. Yeah. And, and, and this is part of, uh, I mean, another aspect of the coming out process. Often we look at coming out as saying, we are blasting to the world our sexuality and telling, yeah. uh, preaching from the highest mountaintops. Yeah. When the, the real aspect behind the coming out is not that you're coming out at all, but you're letting in. Yep. You're allowing people to come into a, a deeper, more transparent part of your life mm -hmm. on your terms Yes. with your invitation. Mm -hmm. And so this story just seems a lot like that true letting in. Um, yep. You are inviting your parents into your life to say, I'm also navigating this for the first time. Yeah. And I'm bringing, I want as many people on the boat as possible yep. to be here uh, with this journey, uh, with me during the journey. Yep. And so I, I appreciate that. And I, and I hope that parents and, and family members and allies who listen to this realize how important open dialogue and those questions are to us. Yep. Because it allows us to also express where we're at. Yep. Um, and, and even if we don't know exactly where we're at, your interest helps us to move forward. Absolutely. I think it's a great point. Yep. And, and really, we can sense when there are expectations or agendas behind questions. Sure. And we, yeah. also, we also prevent ourselves from moving forward or progressing mm -hmm. because we're still, like you brought up, worried about what other people are thinking about us. Exactly right. That right. oxygen mask isn't fully secured. Right. We're still trying to save everybody else and not hurt their feelings or make them feel uncomfortable, that we're still sacrificing our own future. Right. You have to realize that it is not your, it's not your gay relative's job to make you feel comfortable. Very great. I mean, wonderful point. Yeah. They might choose to, I choose to with the people I'm close to, to try to take steps to help them be comfortable around me the same way that they help me to feel comfortable around them. My parents have asked me when I, when I told them I was stepping away from membership in the church or activity in the church, they did not say, um, well, you, you really should keep trying. You really should do this. They said, okay, we pray over meals here. Are, are you comfortable with us doing that? I said, yes. Are you comfortable saying prayers? I said, sure. Are you comfortable if we talk about the church? I said, yes. And they emphasized, they said, we need our home to be comfortable for you because we are not going to lose you. That's it. That's it. That's all I need. That's all I need. That's all I need. Um, and I and they aren't compromising any of their standards. And I'm not. And and so then I am more willing to to like not put them into the in the position to compromise standards. Um, uh, for example, if I were to bring a boyfriend home eventually, and they know that's going to happen, um, they have a house rule that unless you're married, you sleep in separate rooms. Wonderful. That's totally doable. I'm going to make sure that they have say in their house over what I do. And that's easier to do when they have made their home such a comfortable place for me. 
Good point. Yeah. Now you say you, um, let's talk about your navigation out of the church. Okay. Yeah. What, what led you, because again, a common thread, common mm. theme. Um, how did that begin? Where are you at? And where are you going? Yeah. There's, there's... It, it, talk about that in the mission, right? <laughs> yes. Who are we? Where do we come from? This and where is, are we going after this, this life? This is my plan of salvation. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so pull out discussion uh, number six, and oh. let's discuss... Oh, I could make a horrible pun. Plan of oh. Salgation. <laughs> oh, I never thought of Plan of Salgation. That's great. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm disappointed and super proud of myself at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine what our gay heaven's going to look like. Oh, but it's going to be beautiful. There will be glitter and rainbows and sparkly things. And... <laughs> I hope there's a place to go camping, too, though, you know? That's right. So. <laughs> not, all, not all gays are flamboyant. <laughs> That's true. Um... And, and so there's lots of layers to my, my transition out of the church, which involves my interaction with the, my gay friends in the gay community. Um, but to start off, what really led me out or triggered, um, it was the straw that broke the camel's back, it was the pebble that started the avalanche, was um, I had felt uncomfortable at church for a while, um, starting to explore this new side of myself. I was dating guys while going to church. Um, thinking maybe I'll find a guy who I can go to church with and yes we will not be ex participating in certain things but maybe but hopefully he'll take me to the temple <laughs> the gay temple oh, no. oh. <laughs> but right right uh, b but thinking that I could find a way to be both to do both um, and I it's important for me to say that if people find a way to do that and choose to try to do that absolutely legitimate and um, nothing in my story should say that my narrative is the narrative. And that, that's part of what I'm trying to combat in my life is, is to say that my way is the legitimate way. Everyone's narrative is sacred and legitimate. I just kind of want to start by saying that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, it's great. A acknowledge everybody's individual experience. Absolutely. Um, so uh, it was the, um, was it in March or April that um, the, the, uh, 2015 policy regarding same-sex couples um, and et cetera um, was it in March or April that that was kind of I, ca I call it reversed a April 2019 the rescinding of the, the rescinding. November policy yes. yes okay it was that I had lots of friends come up friends who you know everyone I know here in Boise knows I'm gay essentially um, but uh, so they came up to me and, and kind of was like what do you think of this with an air of excitement in their voice um, and I think some of them were a little deflated, and, and I even posted about it on Facebook um, under the, it, it could have been posted by an ally, so it wasn't coming out on Facebook necessarily. Um, but it was, I was so angry. I was frustrated. I felt um, confused that um, it felt like this rescinding was um, the church saying we are fixing a problem in the church that was independent of us. Um, it was, we started the forest fire and now we want credit for putting out the fire. Exactly. And, and I saw the mental and emotional gymnastics that a lot of members were going through to try to explain it. And I just thought to myself, you know what? It's actually very simple to me. It wasn't revealed. It wasn't revelation. This was the wrong thing to do. That's a great point because when it first came out, people are instantly saying, well, because it came from the church, it must be. Yeah. And then when it was rescinded, they said, see, isn't this wonderful? They, and, and when I brought it up, he, I just, again, I, I call it emotional gymnastics yeah. or mental gymnastics to try to explain it. It's the same type of gymnastics when it comes to um, um, the priesthood being given to, um, to black people. Um, Polygamy. Polygamy, right. Word of wisdom. Exactly. All of these things. And um, so I saw that and I said, okay, I feel angry. I feel bitter. And the more I go to church, the more I feel those things. And the main reason I left was I'm not, I don't want to live my life as a bitter person. My family still believes. Many of my friends still believe. My closest friends. I have to be able to love them for who they are and what they believe, not in spite of something they believe. So it was time for me to step away for my own healing. Um, and that then, so my last Sunday was uh, Easter Sunday. It felt very poetic in some way. Um, and it was not 
it was not easy. I was sitting in church, I was singing the hymns, even thinking about it now, I still get those same emotions. I was sad that I've been singing those hymns my whole life and this was the last time that in the same way I was gonna be singing them. There was mourning. There was the death, burial, and resurrection. Very, Absolutely. very Easterish. Oh yes, it was. It was. It was. It was hard. Um, I had several friends, not members of the church, that um, that I, I had prepped. They were waiting in the wings for me to exit that day, and and they and they were waiting to kind of catch me. Um, but I also was prepared to catch myself a little bit. I'd made made sure that this I was ready for this decision. I'd even talked to the bishop, saying. I'm leaving, please give my calling to someone else. Um, you can keep my records here as long as you're willing to, and then when you want to send them off to wherever, then cool, just let me know. Um, and, then I, and then I left and I transitioned out, and that gave me room to start my faith from the ground level and take nothing for granted. Is there a God? Am I a Christian? Um, and, and before I had left, I, had alre I already investigated the whole, part of, part of what another reason I left was, I looked at my beliefs and there were plenty of them that did not align with the church anymore. And so I said, why would I keep going if I don't have these beliefs anymore? The primarily of, uh, the, the most primary of which was um, that the prophets and apostles spoke for God uh, to everyone. And concerning this topic, that's really difficult to answer in the affirmative, given yes. 50 years of rhetoric yeah. that the church has changed yeah. its position on over and over and over again. Yeah. And the scientific community has felt um, the polar opposite experiences mm -hmm. regarding the revelation compared to yeah. scientific yeah. experience and right. fact. Right. Um, it, it just... And under that umbrella fell the proclamation of the family, fell other things that I cannot believe, that I do not believe, um, and other people do. And again, that's super. That's super. But and, don't punish me for your beliefs. Yeah, and maybe other people believe that because they're not compelled to believe differently. Right. Which, which kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. Until you are intimately involved in this topic, when you have someone mm -hmm. uh, direct relationship, a son, a daughter, a friend, yeah. a, someone close to you that is impacted by this topic, it's out of sight, out of mind. Right. Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I've, you know, always heard people say the proclamation to the uh, family is beautiful and it just makes good sense. And to me, it was not beautiful and it made no sense didn't believe it anymore. So um, I want to I want to just dwell on that because I think that's really an important point. Yeah. The family to the proclam the, the proclamation to the world, the family mm -hmm. proclamation didn't make sense to you because you were not straight. There is nothing in that proclamation that gives space for someone who is not straight. It wasn't talking to me. It meant nothing. It, and, and yet it was for everyone some way but it wasn't so it that that it's always been a difficult one um not anymore because now i can look at it as just a belief that's not my own good yeah yeah just just something that's a very interesting point to dwell on yeah um so from there i mean i'm still dating guys i'm meeting guys i'm starting to to get to know people in the gay community here um i'm starting to do that exploration and uh, what I find, and, and this, is, this is hard to talk about too, because um, coming out as gay to my Mormon friends was almost, it's very similar to coming out to my gay friends as LDS slash ex-Mormon. Mm. Because there's very strong feelings, especially in the Idaho, Utah area, in the gay community towards the church. Um, the trench, the war trenches are especially deep in this area and in Utah. Um, and so when I tell people I am ex-Mormon, my, my gay friends, um, some of them took that as automatic license to start 
uh, bad mouthing the church and just saying, "Well, yeah, it's awful. It's horrible. It's and and I said and and, and I, I would end up saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I mean, stop. Just hold on. I'm not bitter and angry, and and I still love my church going family and friends, and um, I I'm trying really hard to." like heal from that so i i mean yes own your feelings but i it's going to be really hard for me to like go there to that same place with that same intensity with you um and, and so that that's been difficult a little bit um but my close gay friends know they know how i feel about everything and all the sympathies i have and and they accept me just like my Mormon friends accept I'm gay. And it's beautiful. Again, there's those same gems in both parties. Um, it's those people that, you said it when you, you, when you introduce your podcast, um, you, you use the word bridge. And that's, and that's the key to building those bridges is, um, is, is I'm trying really hard to heal from the stuff that, was, um, that I experienced in the church and the feelings of bitterness and anger that I felt. Um, and that process is working. Um, and I think if anyone feels angry or bitter or hateful towards a, a religion or this religion, that's, you need to feel those feelings. Those feelings are important. And how could you feel otherwise? But hanging out there for your entire life is hurting you. And we, and I th we all need to find a way to live together. You have to secure your own oxygen mask before helping other people. Yep, yep. So do that, um, and 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 makes and take steps to do that to secure your own ox oxygen ma masks. Otherwise, you know, we're not even you're not even only sacrificing your own health 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 to try to make someone else healthy. You're you're actually doing both of you a disservice because neither of you have have very firm footing. Um, so. That, that puts me in a tough position where um, I'm trying to be a bridge between two communities who um, are you know angry, bitter, hateful towards each other because they're fueled by fear. All of this is because they're afraid that they're going to be hurt by the other side. And so they hold up their shields and they dig their trenches. Um, and building bridges invites people to hurt you sometimes, um, again but it's still an important work that needs to go on. I think that's a great point too. Yeah. Um, knowing, and, and maybe sometimes we, we need to frame this as an expectation situation mm -hmm. where knowing that if we are willing to build a bridge to those who can easily hurt us, uh -huh. that we participated in the building of the bridge. Right. We were the ones that extended into that, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting concept because I'm, I'm part of a number of, of groups, uh, and in discussing this, I think of the Mormons Building Bridges group. Yeah. So very literally, uh -huh. the Mormons Building Bridges yeah. group. Yeah. And there's always some contention in the group where uh, the Mormons, the Latter-day Saint side, says, well, the gay community isn't, been not, they're not nice to us. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not extending a very good bridge. Yeah. When the reality is that the name of the group is Mormons building bridges. Yeah. So the bridge builders should be the members of the church in that scenario. Yeah. Um, to the LGBT community. Yeah. When often, uh, maybe, and so often it's just a it's a role issue. Yeah. So sometimes, um, and even podcast episodes like this, this is us building our bridge. These are yeah, <laughs> right. the latter gays building bridges. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and I think that's the, I think it's a really cool, I used to view uh, being in between the church and the LGBT community as um, just the worst thing. And it paralyzed me. Like I, I had, but now I, I, no one has to take this opportunity. There's no requirement that says you have to do this, but there's a unique opportunity to try to mend some things between the two communities. I agree. I, yeah. I and I see I see in an optimal situation the latter gay ain'ts <laughs> and the latter day saints yeah. together coalescing and saying this is what the bridge should look like. Yep. 
or this is how many lanes the bridge should have. Let's mm -hmm. work together. You begin on your side, I begin on ours, and we will build the bridge together. Absolutely. Th those are the most important. And and as we've discussed with your mission president, with your, with many of your bishops, with your parents, the latter day ain'ts and the latter day mm -hmm. saints mm -hmm. were able to work together um, yep. for a common goal. Yes. The the common goal wasn't to berate you, to mm -hmm. judge you, to misguide you. Or to tell me what to do with my gayness. It was just mm -hmm. to say, I understand where you're at. Yep. Um, and let's make this journey together. Yeah. And it's not only it's not only the, the job of of Mormons to do that um, with their gay members, it's also the job of the LGBT community to when there's a new member <laughs> or someone who's coming out, um, they, we all have the same job to not say, this is the way you're supposed to be gay. There are as many plan people in the plan, uh, there are many, as many plans of salvation as there are people on the earth. Uh -huh. And there are as many ways to be gay yep. as there are gay people on the earth. I, I've had, so Mormons my whole life been telling me, well, you need to try the traditional marriage. You need, you can be single and celibate. You can do, so they're telling me what to do with my gayness. Um, same thing when I came out in the gay community, people tell me, well, you have to, um, explore in this way. You have to be this way. You need to um, fit in in this way. Uh, there's no room for anyone who, for example, doesn't drink, or there's no room for someone who doesn't, you know, sleep around, like things like that, mm -hmm. where the, all these expectations, if you arrive at those things, like if you want to try the world of drinking, that, but it needs to be your choice, not driven by fear of someone eschewing you from the group. And those in the group, it's their job not to push you out based on how you choose to live your life. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, allow. I mean, there, that, therein lies the beauty of exploration. Yep. Yep. You, um, if, if you told someone where to go and how to get there, mm -hmm. we all ended up in handbaskets. Right. Yep. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> And so we need, I, I think a lot of what this bridge looks like is everyone allowing each other to explore. And yes, that involves each other, but it's largely giving everyone space for their own individual exploration. Because yeah. it's a sacred, beautiful thing. And it's not as foreign as any of us um, have led ourselves to, to believe. No. This is, this is very obtainable. A very obtainable and uh, just like my first date being like I couldn't imagine it's now it's so normal it's I'm going on a date with someone and um, it's just I mean it's just like a straight date a little bit just like you're both nervous you're both wondering what the other's thinking you're both like oh, what do I say do the you know what do I wear what you know we, you know primping beforehand I mean uh, it's once you get into it it's just so normal and that and when you explore, exploration is exciting and then it becomes normal to explore. And awesome. It's so, it's so much fun and it's so cool. What does Skylar's future look like? Skylar's future, oh. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a very good question. I want to have, I want to have a partner and I want to commit myself to someone I want to uh explore other like there's there's so much of life to explore I've, I've been exploring my sexuality for you know and I'm, I'm still doing that and I you know I, I always will in some ways but there's many other aspects of life that we're not talking about here and aspects of my identity that I get to explore I'd love to do that and keep you know stay you know all individually for sure but I'd also love to find someone to do that with um and have that and, and have a, a relationship with someone that we connect, we have chemistry, we, I, I want to fall in love. I love Disney movies, what Mormon doesn't? And, <laughs> and, and, and look, yeah, yeah, call me a sap, call me cliche, uh, just, just happily ever after, <laughs> right? Um, with someone uh, would look great. Would it just, and I think a lot of us are looking for that. Um, and uh, we'll and we'll find it. You deserve to be loved. Thank you. Yep. You yeah. Do. Same. Same to you. Is there anything uh, we haven't talked about in the podcast that you wanted to bring up? Um, I think, I think that's everything. That was pretty uh, encompassing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, I'm surprised we. I, I hope it was 
brief enough. <laughs> I, 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 no, it was great. Great. Um, no, I, I think everything's, everything I wanted to, to kind of mention has been mentioned. Um, just, I guess, one last thing to say is, um, is that this process is beautiful. And that experience, the painful, the heartbreaking, the happy, the exciting, the anxiety-inducing is all sacred. And we shouldn't be afraid. Again, nothing should be, our, our actions shouldn't be di dictated by fear, um, but rather radical self-love and self-embracing and the, the word we've used a lot, exploration. Yeah. Now go to thy faith hath made thee whole. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, don't be afraid of yeah. being authentic. Yep. And, and whole. Yep. Yeah. I, I like it. Skylar, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for giving yeah. us a few minutes of your time. Absolutely. Um, Happy to do it. Yeah. And I am I look forward to seeing where you are in six yeah. months and a year. And <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And I want I want your wedding invitation, so let's. <laughs> you will get you will get one. Who needs Tinder when we have the latter gay stories, right? That's right. <laughs> well, let's try to get you a date. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Again, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. The Latter Gay Stories podcast, your opportunity to better understand the intersection of sexuality and reality. Uh, again, a fascinating story about uh, the trail of authenticity and honesty. And as we talk often about um, in this podcast, authenticity requires. Uh, full price. It doesn't bargain. You can't pick it up at a, at a discount on a clearance shelf. It takes everything. And often as we make the journey outside of the closet into a world that feels unknown um, as a newly out individual, there comes with it risks and trepidation and an unexplored world. But that's part of that journey of authenticity. It's part of honesty. It's part of becoming who and what we were uh, divinely created to become. Um, and Skylar's story is, is evidence of that as well, and uh, your story also. If you are following along on one of our video versions and want to make a comment about it this episode, we would love for you to do that in real time and share your thoughts and feelings about uh, Skylar's story, about your own personal journey, and what you've learned in the process. And again, if you are listening on an audio version through iHeartRadio, uh, one of the Apple podcast players, or through Google Play, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and uh, give us a like and rating as well. The Latter Gay Stories podcast, your opportunity to better understand the intersection of sexuality and reality. But most importantly, this is your opportunity to continue writing your Latter Gay story. <laughs>